Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kathy. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to share the stage with the panelists and also speak to you and share the work that I've been taking on for uh, since I've been back to Philadelphia after residency in Washington, D.C. What I'd like to offer to you is, is an understanding of our piece of the work that we feel that we can offer to share with other constituents and other uh, policy makers and other agencies really to work at combating this issue of interpersonal injury and violence in Philadelphia. I'm going to talk to you about Healing Hurt People, which is a trauma-informed violence intervention program based out of Hahnemann Hospital and also St. Christopher's Hospital, with an effort to expand to other hospitals in Philadelphia so that we can address this in a more systemic type of way when we talk about uh, injury that's seen in emergency departments and also in trauma units. First, I want to start with uh, a story of a, of a young person, the who. It's the who that this is affecting mostly. Um, the mayor gave you some statistics in terms of who it impacts mostly in terms of African American men between the ages of 15 and 24. But what, also, what we also need to understand is the trauma, the adversity, and the community exposure to violence that many of the young people that we work with encounter. And if you take a listen to what one of our, one of our, uh, one of our uh, participants has to say, and just think about this through the few minutes that I talked to you about the program, you'll understand both the undergirding theory of practice that we utilize when we're, when we're working with our young people. in the sandbox is allowed today. I was shooting basketball with friends at the playground the first time I saw someone get shot. It was random. I didn't think something like that would happen to me or my family. I have seen a lot. Now I don't sleep at nights. Last year my cousin was killed at home in his bed. While everyone is sleeping, I stay awake. I go to sleep in the morning when people are up and moving around. When I do sleep, I have nightmares. Sometimes I wake up crying, feeling lonely, wanting revenge. I wake up paranoid. But there was something that really hurt me even more than when I got shot three times. I was sitting in the street with my brother's head in my lap. Dude stood over him holding a gun before running away. Dude just left. There was nothing I could do. My brother wanted me to hold him. I was crying, panicking. He said, I'm going to be all right. Little did he know, he wasn't. After that, I knew I would get shot. I started imagining how I would be and how I would hold my body so that they wouldn't shoot me in my heart or my head. When walking in the streets, I would think about how to turn my body so that the bullet would hit my shoulders and not my heart. Or how I would use my hands and arms to shield my head. I'm always looking back over my shoulder at my own shadow, hoping that one day I would stop focusing on my past but looking ahead to my future. This is a digital story process that some of the young men that participate in our program or have participated in our program took on week-long intensive process where they, we pulled their stories and, and condensed it into a three-minute digital story that really tells what they experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what I don't know if you heard in the very beginning is they said not a lot of people in the sandbox are alive today. So that's something that a lot of our young men have to live with and it's just not right just is it right. And so again, I'm going to come back to um, what our program is, how we're working to address this very issue, and our piece of the pie that we offer to collaborate with, on the, with the other agencies to, to stem this tide of violence in Philadelphia. So the when, 
What we've identified and what we feel is an important place is that of the emergency department. Recognizing that homicide is a huge thing that impacts Philadelphia, but also there's this other issue of non-fatal injury. These are the young people that are in a position where they can choose retaliation or can, they can choose change. And we feel that we have an opportunity in the emergency department to help them move toward change and not retaliation. So the way I see it from where I stand in the emergency department, young people come into the emergency department, they're shot, stabbed, assaulted. In some instances, they die, unfortunately, despite our heroic efforts. Sometimes they're treated and released, uh, which is usually the standard of care if there isn't anything else that, that warrants them being admitted to the emergency, admitted to the hospital. If the injury is severe enough, then they do, in fact, might have, they may have to have surgery um, and they're admitted to the hospital. And in some instances, they might get some additional psychosocial services, but that's not guaranteed. But all too often, without anything being in place to address this injured youth, that cycle of violence just comes right back around. They're injured again. And in some instances, in some instances they're killed. There's one study that, there are two studies that demonstrated that 44% of victims that have suffered a penetrating injury, at five years they're re-injured. That same population, 20% are dead. So again, we feel that we have a, have a moment in time where we can have a really impacting, um, some impact on the, the choices that our young people might have to make. The why why we're doing it. It's no surprise again that homicide is expensive and it's overwhelming our medical system. Lost productivity, depending upon how you measure it, is also something that we see that's huge when we look at homicide, when we look at non-fatal injury. Per homicide, it's almost $5,000 in medical care costs. Per non-fatal injury, it's almost $25,000 for one person. And then in 2007, there were $4 billion in medical costs for intentional injury. In 2007, there were $33 billion in lost productivity. And just in Philadelphia alone, lost productivity, lost productivity was $398 million, and then the medical care costs were $39 million. So again, no surprise to many of you, but again, just emphasizing the why this needs to be paid attention. To put this in another, another context, when you think about homicide deaths and war veterans, we see that over the span from 2001 to 2010, there were 14, over 1,400 war fatalities in Afghanistan. In Philadelphia, there were, all, there were 3,391 homicide deaths as it related to violence. And in Iraq, there were 4,430 war fatalities. So again, just to put it in context, Philadelphia is in the middle of this as we ref make reference to a war zone. So again, it's definitely an issue in terms of the why we need to pay attention to it. The average childhood experience also gives us fuel to our theory of practice in terms of why we do the work we do the way that we do it. And just if you pay attention to that very last line, average childhood experiences determine the likelihood of the 10 most common causes of death in the United States. We know that there's a dose-response relationship between the number of exposures to advanced adverse childhood experiences, the more likelihood you are to develop one of those chronic diseases. And so again, we feel that we have a really right time to have an impact on the lives of the young people that we see. What? The What is the Healing Hurt People? It's a program that's based out of the two emergency departments that I mentioned to you. And our efforts are really to recognize and address trauma and adversity. We're looking to decrease re-injury, decrease retaliation as well. Um, we want to decrease involvement with the criminal justice system and we're working to develop with so Stoney support to develop a best practice in that because we do need the evidence to show that this does in fact work. Anecdotally, I can tell you that it does work. Over the past year, we served about 121 um, clients, um, and we've changed their trajectory. We've plugged them in with health care, and we've connected them to other services that they would benefit from. Um, and also, we can't do it alone. It is, it is 
uh, important that we do community building and engagement so that we know those providers that we trust that will take care of the young people that we're working with. The how we do it, again, I mentioned this trauma-informed practice which comes out of the sanctuary work. Um, self is a nonlinear conceptual framework which really is the, which really what undergirds the program and how it actually works. Safety, emotional management, loss, and future. Those are the, those are the four components that we work in, both as, team, as a team, but also something that we impart to the young people that we work with. What's their idea of safety? What will make them safe? How will they be safe? How they, make, how they deal with their emotions, how they manage their emotions. What's their idea of a future? Changing that, because a lot of times, many of them just don't have any idea what their future could or should be. And then the loss. Many of the young people that we've worked with have experienced lots of loss. If you think about David in his, in his description that he's lost a brother, many people in the sandbox are not alive today. Constant loss, constant adversity. These are things that we have to address in order to help our young people have better health outcomes. Finally, the different components of the program. And again, all of this is undergirded by this trauma-informed practice in the self-framework. Process is that of we do an assessment, identify post-traumatic stress symptoms, adversity. We educate the patient about those symptoms that they might experience or encounter. Um, navigation is something really important in connecting the young people to the various services that have been identified in the assessment. And we connect them to those services because in some instances they just don't recognize or know how to access those services. And again, by no means are we making an excuse but offering an explanation as to why this is important to help change the trajectory of the lives of our young people. Mentoring, the day-to-day -day activities of our outreach worker and the young person does give them an opportunity to constantly engage in that conversation around safety, emotional management, loss, and future. And it does provide a type of mentoring that the young person doesn't necessarily have or doesn't have. Our psychoeducational groups, which is something really powerful uh, in that we bring young men together to really talk about their feelings. We work in that same framework of safety, emotional management, loss, and future. And I know it's difficult to believe that a group of young men between the ages of 18 and 27 come together to talk about their feelings. They do, in fact, do it because there's a place for them to do it. And we make it safe for them to do that. And then we have our injury case review. Right now, it's pretty, it's pretty contained at the level of our institution where we bring about, we talk about a specific case. And this is something else that Stoney is helping us to develop to bring it to a larger scale. What we do, very similar, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Philadelphia Youth Fatality Review Team, which is an amazing team that really tells the story of what happened to this person that has been, that has been killed. But my critique for that is that it is, in fact, someone that's been, that's been killed. And so we want to take some steps back and look at this injured youth and tell the story and paint the picture of where the gaps are. And that's what we've been doing. Now, right now, what we've been able to do is pretty much fill those gaps through the work, through our various connections and through our relationships with other organizations to help get our young person to a better place or a better service that they could benefit from. It's made up of an interdisciplinary team that represents emergency medicine, myself, psychiatry, psychology, social work, internal medicine, public health. We have someone from the Office of Violence Prevention and Victim Services in the police department that attends. We also have someone from the Department of Human Services. And again, we're trying to figure out and identify those gaps in services where we can have a role in promoting policy or making policy recommendations to change and fill those gaps that we've identified. Gleaning some support or some evidence behind the work, we did a, a cross-sectional study of the, of the <coughs> participants that in our program. And what we found in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder, 77% of the young people had full-blown PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so you can imagine what happens when post-traumatic stress disorder goes unaddressed and untreated. So at this point, we at least recognize that we do have to make the connection to this group of people to mental health services. The other piece was we looked at childhood adversities. And 50% of the patients 
had an average childhood score of four or more. Now in the larger study, about 25% had an average childhood experience of two or more. These young people had four or more. So you know that already has an impact on their health outcome. But again, we're saying that if we have, if we have intervention in place, we can in fact make a difference in their health outcome or their trajectory. This really is a depiction of the, of the, the uh, study, the research design of the study that we're taking on to demonstrate the effectiveness of the program. As I said, anecdotally we see that we do make a difference in the lives of the young people, but we need the science and the evidence that shows that it does in fact do that. Again, something that Stone has been supporting my efforts in doing this. On the, so it'll be on your right, you'll see everyone that receives the services of Healing Hurt People. And we're gonna be measuring them, we're gonna be measuring um, social support, resilience, uh, community exposure to violence, average child experiences, and post-traumatic stress uh, disorder um, in the, in the um, experimental group, as well as the waitlisted group. Because you can imagine our capacity is not one such that we can take everyone. So we do have to waitlist people to get the full services of the program. And what we are hypothesizing is that, in fact, the involvement with our program, we will, in fact, it decrease the full development of post-traumatic stress disorder and sleep quality and quality and depression. And we feel that in doing that, we will improve the health outcomes of the young people. And so all this is the work that we're doing together, and again, we offer a piece of the pie, a piece of the puzzle to really combat this issue. And then we also have to thank all of our supporters that make this possible. The Scatterbit Foundation, the Stoney Foundation, of course, um, Drexel University, and also the Department of Behavioral Health, as well as the Department of Human Services. And it is true, we have every bit of faith that our children are dying, but we can, in fact, stop it. And that's what we're doing to do it. And we're looking to join everyone's efforts that are doing it together. Thank you.